today's Sunday broadcast. <coughs> Today I'm going to be sharing information about the aura. This is actually the third talk that I have given on this subject. And today, I can honestly say today's talk is mind-blowing. <laughs> so, it's so remarkable. It's very super mundane. I was going to ask for hands up of how many people can actually see an aura. And also then on the chat with our Zoom broadcast to put in your chat, yes, I can see an aura. And then I opted out of that. <laughs> but you can answer it in your mind. What's exciting to know, especially if you can see auras, what it is that you're seeing. If you are a therapist, this would be the greatest gift that you, as a client, could be given to go to a therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, a spiritual counselor that can see auras. Once you can see an aura, to the advanced degree that I'm going to be talking about today, that therapist would be your greatest friend, your best friend. Because being able to see clairvoyantly the aura of a person, the complete aura of a person can put you back in track, on track. And to transform yourself in such a way that your life will be light years ahead spiritually than where it is today. So some people want to see the aura. Part of a person's aura can be seen or at least detected by electronic instruments. But if you have, if you develop higher clairvoyance, you're going to see the aura as clearly as you do physical objects. with your physical eyes. Can you imagine that? I remember the first time I saw an aura, I was sitting in a class with a very dear friend of mine, how to develop your ability to see an aura. We were so young, we were so young back then, and so excited. And the, uh, the teacher taught us how to see an aura with the physical eyes. It was not due to spiritual development. It was just a technique. And I'll never forget. The thing is for myself is once I learned how to see a Nora, then I couldn't shut it off. <laughs> and that became a problem in itself. Uh, but over time, I've been able to uh, monitor it and turn it off uh, because it can be quite distracting. But you can imagine the first time of seeing someone's aura. And there's, a, there's actually a science, and I, I don't want to get too far off from my notes, so we'll never get through the talk this morning. It's a bit long. But there is a science to seeing the physical radiation of an aura, the normal radiation of an aura, which is just a few inches from the body. and. Say, for example, that you have, that you can see the color yellow through the color blue, or that you can see red through the color of green. In other words, you're looking at someone that has a radiance of a green aura you're also going to see another color with that, and that color is red. And the color of yellow can be seen with the physical color of blue. So these are things that I learned that later I learned an artist knows what colors are missing. You, it's, see, I can't explain it. It's like you see a color blue, but the aura of blue is yellow. And apparently, there is, artists know this, 
not that they're seeing the aura, but they will recognize certain colors that make up one color and certain colors that are missing out of that color that makes up that color. So part of this is also a science. It's so exciting. Uh, and then it moves beyond the science of the physical colors into uh, the aura of a human being. So true clairvoyance cannot be developed artificially or even by working on the centers, but, but by living a life of renunciation and service. So if you're not yet able to see <coughs> auras, then put yourself in the path of renunciation and sacrificial service. Clairvoyance is like a flower, which at first was a seed buried in the earth, but in time it surfaces and blooms. If conditions are favorable, especially. All true psychic gifts are naturally bloom flowers, the result of lives lived in striving and sacrificial service. You can imagine the first time I saw an aura of one of my puppy dogs. <laughs> I was just mesmerized and, and the aura became so strong because I was able to see it better that all I could see eventually the dog faded away and all I could see was the color. And this happens with people as well, is that if the emanation of a person's aura is so radiant and so bright, then the person fades away and all you can see with that individual or object is the aura. It's very interesting. But it does take this, this gift, this psychic gift, let's call it, is the, it does take time uh, to surface and bloom, but it will. Let me share a little bit what Agni Yoga has to say about the aura. Agni Yoga emphasizes the importance of the aura as a reflection of a person's spiritual development and inner qualities. In Agni Yoga, the aura is seen as a subtle energy field that surrounds and interpenetrates the physical body, surrounds and interpenetrates the physical body, which then reflects a person's thoughts and emotions and spiritual radiations. The teaching explains that the aura is not static, but dynamic, constantly changing, and influenced by the person's spiritual practices, thoughts, and actions. A pure and radiant aura is believed to indicate a high spiritual awareness, inner harmony, and positive intentions. The practice of Agni Yoga encourages individuals to work on purifying and strengthening their aura through self-discipline, through service to others, and cultivating virtues such as compassion and selflessness. By aligning your thoughts and actions with higher spiritual principles, it is believed that the aura can become a most powerful tool for spiritual growth, healing, and protection. In essence, Agni Yoga views the aura as a reflection of one's inner state and a key element in the journey towards spiritual enlightenment and transformation. Now, Agni Yoga gives a little more detail about the aura, saying that the egg-shaped aura is characteristic of the astral body. An egg-shaped aura is characteristic of the astral body. The most ordinary aura 
is the narrow aura that radiates around the entire body, typically extending about two inches. According to the degree of the person's spirituality, it then begins to grow from the upper centers. It starts from the solar plexus, but later then rises to the brain centers and forms the so-called solar aura. Powerful influxes of blood typically occur, now this is the phenomenon that takes place as your aura is growing, that powerful influxes of blood typically occur during the shifting of the aura, when the current of tension is shifting its pressure. Even fainting spells may occur. Eventually, the radiation disappears from the lower extremities and then gathers into a ring. While still in the midst of ordinary life, the organism becomes keenly sensitive, especially to sound and color. It is necessary to have as much tranquility as possible during this transitional period. The solar aura may extend by now. We went from two inches to 10 to 15 inches in extension. Of course, its dimension may increase even still further. In spite of the discomfort involved in this transposition of the aura, we can congratulate a person who has obtained the upper radiation. Care should be taken in creating opportunities to rest. And this is why you'll read in the various uh, let's call it biographies of Helena Rourke, the mother of Agni Yoga, the master would tell her continuously about the importance of rest. Care should be taken to rest. Later, later, a new armor grows, as it were, and the nerves of the skin now become firm. One cannot draw a hard and fast line between the physical and the spiritual. The balance fluctuates and the waves travel about throughout the organism. So all though this state should not be called an illness, Moment by moment, the person has to help their organism to gain strength in its new condition. So oftentimes, when the Agni Yogi is going through such shiftings of their aura, the process of the blood is going into the brain and the centers of the brain, the tension is increasing. Uh, this is part of the transformational uh, process of change that the Agni Yogi person is going through and it does take its toll. Uh, what we would say, you know, from an earthly point of view, uh, takes its toll on the health of the individual. And this is why when we read about Helena Rourke, we read about uh, terms such as sacred pains. And you read about the difficulties she had with her body, her organism adapting and adjusting uh, to all these changes in the aura. But this is just because in terms of infinity, our physical body is still very much underdeveloped. So Lady Rourke blazed the pathway 
for us to realize in, in our own experiences the process of transformation as it occurs with the aura. A few weeks ago, I talked about the health of the aura. The health aura is, this is interesting, that the health aura is not the radiation of any center or any vehicle, but a manifestation of the pranic energy on the surface of the body. The etheric spleen, your etheric spleen, not your physical, but your etheric spleen receives the prana. And the reason I bring this up is because oftentimes a person has had their spleen removed and then the inevitable question that we all would ask is, if you don't have a physical spleen, does this mean you don't have prana? No, the answer is no. It's because you still have the etheric spleen. And it's through the, the etheric spleen, it's the etheric spleen that receives the prana and then distributes it throughout your entire etheric network and manifests as a particular radiation on the surface of your body. And this is what's called the health aura. It is called the health aura because the health of the body depends on the proper intake of prana and the proper circulation of prana in the body. When the health aura appears stable and radiant, we say that a person is healthy. A healthy aura is the result of a number of factors, such as the proper circulation of prana in the etheric and physical bodies, harmony between the etheric body, the astral body, and the mental bodies, and the presence of certain devas that contribute to the forming of the health aura. The auras of people different, differ from each other in many ways. For example, there are oval auras, there are balloon auras, there are dislocated and diffused auras, there are dirty or chaotic auras, separated and loose auras, cracked and obsessed auras, contagious auras, radiant and dynamic auras, group auras, auras blended with the master, overshadowing auras, mixed auras, and frozen or crystallized auras. And this is what the teaching is giving us. You won't find this in the New York Times Sunday paper. <laughs> <laughs> the teaching helps us to understand these differences, and this is what I'm going to share today. The oval aura is the most natural aura, the oval aura. And this is the aura that we see pictures of uh, different spiritual teachers, and uh, particularly back in the day of theosophy, uh, when theosophy was just getting its start, uh, some of their early teachers would, uh, th that were clairvoyant, and they would uh, draw paintings of a person's aura. And, and this is what we typically see, is the oval aura. But then there is a balloon aura, and this is what I'm going to be sharing now these different types of aura is so important for the person that can see auras. As you're developing your aura, you want to know what you're seeing means. So if we take, for example, the balloon aura. A balloon aura is when a part of the aura hangs like a balloon around the head or at the sides. This is called a balloon aura. Such a person is going to feel that a part of themselves 
is not anchored to the brain or to the body. In other words, there's a disassociation when this balloon aura takes place and they don't feel anchored. They can't relate to their environment. They can't relate to other people and they feel disassociated uh, from their life. This aura is one of the main causes for epilepsy. A dislocated has a part of the aura which is not in its right place. It's called a dislocated aura. For example, the mental aura is normally, normally around the head, and then it extends to the shoulders. That's the part of the aura that we call the mental aura. It's considered dislocated when it is found on the solar plexus. You can imagine that. Rather than the mental aura, now it is shifted. It's dislocated, and it is now found on the solar plexus or the sacral center. The causes of dislocation are many. It sometimes occurs slowly when continuous attention is placed on the stomach or sex organs. Fear. Fear can dislo dislocate parts of the aura, either permanently or temporarily. Dislocation can happen when a person loses something or someone dear to them. Each time dislocation occurs, the person comes closer to losing their stability. Many mental conditions originate from the dislocation of the aura. It affects logic. In other words, the person will become very illogical. No reasoning ability. No common sense. This dislocation of the mental conditions also creates confusion, lightheadedness, absent-mindedness, and to the extreme, insanity. Now drugs, marijuana, I am sorry to say this, as marijuana is becoming increasingly popular and legal, nonetheless, nonetheless, it is not good for us. So drugs and marijuana and alcohol contribute tremendously to the dislocation of a person's aura. A diffused aura is one in which the colors and formations are in an ill-defined condition. The mental and emotional lives of such people are characterized by uncertainty, by confusion, and inertia. That's the diffused aura. A dirty or chaotic aura is in ever-changing motion in which one cannot see any recognizable pattern. And this is fairly common, I'm sorry to say. Their colors mix and disappear. And then return, but they return in different locations and form different mixtures in which there is no harmony. Such people are oftentimes diagnosed as bipolar, for example. A separated aura occurs when one's mental and astral bodies look separated from the body. This is a warning that the person is going to die very soon. Now there's a, a myth that has been written about in spiritual teachings that when the light goes out of the eye, the eyes, that's when you know a person is dying. But that's not, that's like an exoteric truth. 
the esoteric truth is that the aura itself becomes separated from the body. And this is a warning that the person is going to die very soon. Such a condition also occurs under the pressure of heavy guilt feelings, self-rejection, or a determination to commit suicide. All this, this behavior results in a separated aura. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, a separated aura also occurs before an accident, which you can tell will occur, or in a moment of great horror. Sometimes, instead of separation, the aura contracts and disappears into the body. And when this happens, then it causes heavy pressure upon the heart, the kidneys, and the brain. High blood pressure is the direct result of such a condition. Sometimes dislocation in the emotional and mental bodies continues in the subtle and fiery worlds. The human soul is the center of the aura, but it loses the central position because of the dislocation and the separation of the aura. The aura is still tied to the human soul, but it's tied by the life thread in this instance. Now there is a partial separation of the aura can take place, and this occurs if the person has developed their various bodies. A partial separation of the aura takes place if the person has developed certain bodies. For example, a person can take their mental body and travel to a far distant land for a special service. A clairvoyant would see the absence of the mental aura form around the body, which may return shortly after the labor has been completed. Our vehicles can be used by our inner guide on special occasions, often without our conscious awareness. During these times, our body feels tired. During such an experience, it is suggested that we remain silent and relaxed until the vehicle is returned to their body. And typically, it's the mental body. On such occasions, the mental body is usually used. Now we have what's called a loose aura. A loose aura is one that fluctuates in and out, creating great waves of what you might imagine, instability. Instability in the mind, instability in the emotions, and instability with one's health. That's what a loose aura can do. Then we have a cracked aura, which is very dangerous. Cracks occur when the circumference of the astral aura breaks, and the mental aura now begins to flow into the astral aura, or vice versa, and go from astral to mental, or mental to astral. It also happens that the astral aura flows into the etheric body. So this is called a cracked aura. And why is it dangerous? The cracked aura puts a person in contact with astral, mental, or etheric entities who misuse them and make their life miserable. If a cracked aura absorbs the energies of higher planes 
the centers and corresponding organs of the cracked vehicles are burned. Brain tumors and various degenerative diseases are a direct result of an influx of energy for which the physical body is just not ready. This is, for example, those of you who engage in seed thought meditation or contemplation, which is a more advanced approach to meditation, you are given, like White Mountain has uh, various levels of meditation from beginning to advanced. And in the instructions of the meditation course, it will say meditate two to three minutes, or meditate five minutes, or in an advanced course, it will say meditate, but no longer than 15 minutes. This is not reading uh, or looking at pictures or diagrams. That's not meditation that I'm talking about in this case. It is literal meditation where you're able to take your consciousness into the light of the higher mind and from there into the spiritual triad, which is the super mundane world, which is the fiery world. If your physical body is not ready, if it cannot adapt to these very intense fire energy, then you're going to have diseases as a result. This is why it's so important to take instruction, just to follow instruction. Don't challenge it, don't argue, uh, don't engage in a back and forth, well, should I or maybe I don't have to look who I am kind of discussion. Take the words of the great teachers. They know what they are instructing. Just, you know, give your own ego up as one of the pieces of music Torkin used to have was saying, throw your ego into the ocean and follow instruction. This will keep you healthy. Sometimes a teacher will tell a student, stop meditating for a year, or maybe stop meditating for the rest of your life. This is so important to follow the instruction of the teacher. It will keep you safe, it will keep you healthy and sane. An obsessed aura. An obsessed aura is a very unhealthy condition in which many astral and etheric entities come and dwell in your aura. It's just like you're renting out your body. <laughs> they not only create a split personality, confusion, and tension, but they also take over the lower centers and use them for excessive sex and slander and malice and destruction. That's an obsessed aura. So let me share a little bit about the various kinds of obsessing entities that exist. There are earthbound entities. Earthbound entities are those who seek to possess you in order to experience and have contact with the physical world. So it's, it's like um, thinking of when I used to live in Florida and I would visit Disney World. And the lines, you know how those lines of people would go this way and this way and this way and this way and this way. Well, imagine now that these are entities in the etheric and astral world that are waiting to come into contact and experience the physical world. These are called earthbound entities. You don't want to allow earthbound entities to possess you. Now, this is interesting. Wives or husbands that have passed on, that you betrayed by your actions, will 
some of them will come back and try to haunt you. Also, they will not necessarily be in a transitional state, but when they go to sleep at night, they're still here on earth, they go to sleep at night, leave their body, and they will come and try to obsess you. Be faithful. Be faithful. Or you are subjecting yourself to obsession. Dark, I know this is kind of shocking, <laughs> but it's, it's just the way it is. <laughs> and then another type of obsessing entity are called low level spirits. Mediums, channels, and lower psychics are low level nature spirits. That's how they're recognized. Dark forces that hate your progress and are able to enter your aura because of your various weaknesses. So these are the various kinds of obsessive entities. Now, back to the aura, a pinched aura. A pinched aura is a wounded aura. This kind of aura comes into being as a result of psychic attacks or bad thoughts and emotions or people directing bad thoughts to you. Psychic attacks from dark forces create rents in your aura. But those who are shielded by their teacher, by a master, by a discipleship group, will repel such attacks. <clears throat> and then there's a contagious aura. A contagious aura is one that is filled with malice, hatred, fear, anger, greed. These emotions of jealousy, especially jealousy, these emotions have specific colors and formations. Those who come close to such an aura absorb its pollution. They come to you if you have a polluted aura, absorb its pollution into their aura, and now their aura is contaminated, or your aura is contaminated. A radiant aura is the healthiest aura there is through which our unfolding human soul radiates, creating geometrical configurations in their aura and splendid colors. A radiant aura spreads joy and enthusiasm and inspiration. Like sunshine, it brings life to people within its sphere of influence and leads them towards success and achievement and service and creativity. <laughs> a radiant aura develops after a person has passed the first initiation. The first initiation is the birth, this is from the teaching, is the birth of the human soul. The first initiation is the birth of the human soul. When the life the light of the human soul radiates out into the periphery of the aura, energizing and stimulating the etheric centers. It's the first initiation. Radiation increases as a person steps into greater stages of initiation. Their light shines out until the third initiation, when their total aura becomes transfigured, and they reach the stage of transfiguration. That's the fourth. After the fifth initiation, they radiate the 12 rays, which gradually, remember the 12 colors I was talking about last time, which gradually bring them into contact with the heart center of the solar logos. It's interesting to note that in the first initiation, there are three 
radiations or rays. This is the first initiation. There are three rays or radiations. In the second initiation, there are five. In the third initiation, there are seven rays or seven radiations. In the fourth initiation, there are nine. And in the fifth initiation, there are 12. Those who develop their aura shine out as natural healers and benefactors of humanity. A, dy a dynamic aura is a highly energized aura due to fiery streams of energy coming from the higher centers or ethers. This is, a, again, it's called a dynamic aura. Such an aura spreads enthusiasm and love and energy and keeps groups and organizations in continuous labor for the service of humanity. And then if you recall, I said there is another kind of aura called the group aura. The group aura is a phenomenon that appears in individuals who have very close relations with their family members or group members. No matter how far the individuals are from one another, their auras still reflect each other. They re their auras reflect the auras of the members of their group or the members of their family. When they are all together, all their auras blend and fuse. Such auric formations provide a great help to the hierarchy because through such groups, the great ones can safely transmit their energies to the world. The group aura is possible only when there is total love and absence of criticism. An aura blended with the master is achieved when you pay all your karmic debt and sanctify your life for the service of the hierarchy. A portion, listen to this, a portion of the master's intuitive and atomic aura comes and fuses itself with the disciple's aura and becomes a permanent station of contact with the master. So you yourself become a station with the master. In this relationship, the disciple lives and works only, only for the plan of their master. All their expressions are performed in the light of their, mas of their master's presence. Then we have the overshadowing aura, which is a part of the aura of a great one which is sent to you as a rain cloud of spiritual inspiration. This is located above your head and continuously transmits great ideas, visions, wisdom, and revelations to your head or heart and prepares you to take on a great responsibility. The overshadowing aura guides and protects you and helps you fulfill your mission. It gradually becomes a transmitting station between you and your teacher. So there's the two stations I'm talking about. And when you read the teachings, it will talk about the various stations. Usually we relate the stations to stations in the super mundane world. But these are two stations that occur in the world of discipleship between yourself and the master, yourself and greater beings. I know that doesn't make sense, but think about it, and it will. We are told that Joan of Arc was overshadowed. Also, both Roosevelt and Churchill were overshadowed during World War II. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, and others throughout history have been overshadowed. A mixed aura 
comes into existence through sexual intercourse, a mixed aura through sexual intercourse. During sexual intercourse, two auras mix and blend, and parts of each aura are absorbed into the other. It's called a mixed aura. Advanced clairvoyants can see in your aura the image of the one with whom you have had sex. Tell your teenage children, let them know about this. Sometimes such a relation advances your evolution. Sometimes it retards it, according to the level and karmic accumulations of your partner. We're going to run over about three minutes. A crystallizing frozen aura is like a swimming pool in which ice formation takes place. In certain conditions, the human aura crystallizes, and there are patches of the aura floating in certain parts of the aura and they become stationary, these parts become stationary. Dogma, doctrine, prejudice, and fanaticism create crystallizations in one's aura. There's so much I could share, Gordon, but it's too bad. Maybe, maybe in the future. We're just out of time. So these crystallizations prevent the free circulation of energy in the aura, and they deteriorate the glands and organs in the body. This is a crystallizer frozen aura. Petrification or atrophy of certain glands is a direct reflection of crystallized patches in the aura. Crystallized portions of the aura look like calluses that cannot receive or transmit energy. They are dead parts of the aura that eventually come together and form a large blockage in the aura. Certain malfunctions of organs or painful attacks of disease are the direct result of such accumulated crystallizations. It is important to know that joy, gratitude, tolerance, solemnity, honesty, nobility, and courage make our auras beautiful. So I'm going to repeat this so you can write it down and begin. Let these words, these actions be your mantra of life. Joy, gratitude, tolerance, honesty, solemnity, nobility, and courage. All true changes to our aura come from the unfolding centers and from an expanding consciousness. In closing, transmutation in the aura resembles a pool of water that slowly becomes pure because new streams of clean water pour in and wash away any old murky waters until the whole pool is turned into a mirror of water. This imagery helps us understand the process, but in reality, transmutation is a process of release from the limitations of the lower levels and entering into the freedom of higher spheres. Transmutation and transformation eventually lead to that phenomenon or that state of beingness that we call transfiguration. So in fact, today, I've been talking about what prevents us transmutation, what prevents transformation, what prevents transfiguration 
and just the opposite of what allows these three stages of spiritual development to occur. When transfiguration takes place, the whole aura in the human form becomes radioactive. After centuries, transfiguration culminates in resurrection. In this event, the nucleus is released from the aura, from all the vehicles of the person. This is a very important statement, so I'm going to not explain it, but I'm going to repeat it again and make a note, particularly if you are a student of Agni Yoga and Ageless Wisdom. There's, there's, a, there's a hint in this statement about the soul. In the event of transfiguration, this, in this event, the nucleus is released from the aura. What is, ask yourself, what is the nucleus? The nucleus is released from the aura, from all the vehicles of the person, and turns into a sphere of glorious light beyond the limitations of time and space as we understand these terms within the sphere of the cosmic physical plane or within the sphere of our brain.